Jesus is God, Jesus is Lord, Jesus has the victory. We all have a call, a call to greatness, a desire for it. We want to do something good. Now is your time. You could change the world, and the world needs changing, so get busy. Shalom World, God's own channel. soul and divinity. She pulled the trigger and she shot me in the chest. Shh, you're healed. He stopped and he looked up above my head and his face looked terrified. And so it got to a point after several years where I realized one day that when I woke up in that morning and I said the words, I forgive this man for what he did to me, I realized that I believed those words and they were true. And I saw how different my life had become when I was able to forgive and how much peace I had and I had joy and I was able to love myself for who God made me. And that was incredible. And I think of it as though, kind of like the Wizard of Oz, you know the movie? How many of you seen it? Many? Good. Okay. I, I, I asked like high schoolers once and half of them hadn't seen it and I was like, are you kidding me? Oh my gosh. <laughs> so, such a classic movie. So I, I feel like it was, um, that time was a lot like that movie of when it starts out in black and white and then once I was able to forgive, it was though the color came back again and there was joy and laughter and excitement and it was just amazing how this huge transformation, and yet I knew I still needed healing. I wasn't fully healed, but I had so much, like so much of my mountain had been moved for healing that I was able to live a fulfilling life again. And it was just absolutely incredible. And after that, I really became passionate about reaching out to young women, um, and especially on college campuses, and sharing them, and just this desire to share this healing that I experienced with them, because I know so many women have been hurt in this, um, at this time in our world, and men as well. And so my just desire to share this, and so I worked with uh, a group called University Christian Outreach, which is somewhat similar to Focus, actually. And um, I worked with them for over 10 years, reaching out to women on universities around the United States and even um, the world. And so I always forget, I grew up in Michigan, so I forget that like Canada is a different country. I'm like, it's like another state for me. Um, but yeah, so the world, Canada, Mexico, and um, in Scotland, I spent some time in Scotland too. So yeah, I was just really passionate about that. And after that, I ended up moving to Mexico for a while, and then I moved to Los Angeles. And I, uh, I had a busy life in LA, um, but I loved it. And it's easy for us, and I've experienced, I don't know, at least for me, it's easy for me to romanticize the past. I don't know if any of you guys struggle with this, but um, to look at a time and think, oh my gosh, if I could only be back there again, that was such a perfect time in my life. Um, I know, it, but realizing that it was good, but it was never perfect. And so I still had struggles in LA. But I, um, I loved what I was doing. I was working in Hollywood with an organization called Act One, and they train Christian writers and people who want to be producers to be very successful and work in mainstream media. And so the alumni are doing amazing things and making amazing movies in Hollywood. One of the movies that alumni um, from Act One had a big part in making was The Blind Side. I don't know if any of you guys saw that. Awesome movie, yeah got Sandra Bullock her Oscar, so um, yeah. So they're doing amazing, amazing work, and I was really excited to be a part of that. And I got to do awesome things, like go to screenings and, um, and evening like parties and stuff. And So it was a fun time, but it was very stressful, very busy. I was drinking about four to five cups of coffee a day with lots of cream and sugar. And then when I would come home from an event as a stress reliever, I would eat some ice cream, peanut butter, chocolate, haagen -Dazs. Oh my gosh, so good. So I would eat that, like, several spoonfuls of that, and I wondered why I had a hard time sleeping at night. 
Yeah, it took me a while to figure it out, but then I, <laughs> later I did. Now I'm, de- I'm caffeine-free. I still love my coffee. Got to have my coffee, but I'm caffeine-free. Um, so I was busy, and I was stressed out, but I loved what I was doing, and I had made some wonderful friends, and I was involved with so many different things. Um, I was in- also involved with Catholic Underground in L.A., which was an amazing ev- is an amazing event, a lot of fun. And so things were busy, and I, it was exciting for me to see how far I've come from living to, in another country by myself and then moving to Los Angeles on my own and an independent woman working in Hollywood. It was really exciting to see how, just how much God had worked in my life to get me there. And um, so I remember um, one day I was on my way to a friend's apartment. I had to drop some keys off because he was going to pick up our other friend from the airport in the morning. And so um, I could have gone in the morning, but I really wanted to sleep in. And I hadn't slept in in a while, and I was really excited to sleep in. So I was like, no, I'll just do it at, at, tonight. And it was 11 o'clock. And in this part of town, it was in West Ho- near West Hollywood, and it's a very busy street. Um, it's down the street from the Beverly Center, like a block away from the Beverly Center, which is a very popular mall. And in fact, if you're ever like flipping through smut magazines, and they'll be like, celebrity so-and-so at the mall. And sometimes they even say, at Beverly Center. And I saw tons of people there all the time. So this was a very populated area, and it was kind of like um, a New York idea in New York City where it was super busy. I mean, people were just, clubs were just opening, people were lined up at the streets. So it was 11, 11, 15-ish at night, but it wasn't a big deal for me to be out at that time walking by myself at all. There were tons of people out. So I didn't think anything of it. So I was on my way to a friend's house, and all of a sudden, um, I heard this young woman, and, um, and I turn, and she starts running past me almost. And I think, my first thought is, oh no, I wonder if something's wrong. And I was just about to say, like, do you need help? And I felt my body being whirled around. And all of a sudden, I'm face to face with this young woman. And I had my purse, and it had two straps. And she had one strap in one of her hands. The other one was caught in my arm. And she had a gun in her other hand. And she looked at me, and she said, give me your purse, we'll shoot. And I looked her right in the eye, and I said, I have no money. I'm a missionary. Please don't shoot me. She pulled down with my, and grabbed my purse off my arm, and with her other hand, she pulled the trigger, and she shot me in the chest. The bullet entered into my chest up here, and it crossed my chest, because I was standing at an angle, up to my right clavicle. When it crossed my chest, it missed my aorta by one centimeter. The fragments of the bullet hit both of my lungs, and they collapsed, and it tore my esophagus. The surgeons later told me that I should have dropped at the moment the bullet hit me. He said, we don't know why you're alive. Not only did I not drop dead, I didn't fall at all. When this was mentioned at the trial, the defense attorney actually stopped and did a double take and said, you mean you didn't fall? And I said, no, I didn't. He was like, how? He couldn't even understand how that was possible. When I tell detectives and other people who in military, um, they're always shocked as well. And they're like, you, you should have fought, fallen with the force of the bullet. So I stayed standing. And she got into her car, a, a waiting car, and they took off down the street. And so I had just been crossing the street at an intersection. So I was going to, I thought, oh, I should um, wave down a car to get help. And then all of a sudden I thought, no, actually, I should get the license plate number of the car. So I turn around, and I, you know, I start running down the street in the middle of the road, chasing this car. Yeah. <laughs> I'm running. <laughs> Yeah, I think I'm kind of (laughs) crazy. Now that I look back, what was I doing? So I'm running down the street, and I start praying. And I'm like, God, how am I supposed to catch up to a car at a time like this? (laughs) All of a sudden, the car stalled. And I said, thank you, Jesus. (laughs) Then I pray again, and I'm like, Lord, how am I supposed to remember a license plate number at a time like this? I've just been shot. I told him, just in case, you know, he didn't know or something. (laughs) And I get close enough to see the car, and the license plate was a word, and the word was shield. 
And I was like, thank you, Jesus. I can remember that. And I, so I turn around and I start running down the street again to the intersection. And you know, when I think about shield, I think about the scripture verse, thou, O Lord, art a shield about me, and just how much she was protecting me. And I also think about our blessed mother and her mantle of love and protection, and believing that she was there with me, protecting me once again. And uh, I actually was wearing this medallion that I have on tonight, or today, um, of Our Lady of Guadalupe. And it was a medal that I found um, in my apartment that was given to my roommate's brother. And so they let me have it. And um, so it's Our Lady of Guadalupe. And um, I really believe that, um, that she just really was with me again, protecting me. So I waved down a car. And um, well, actually, there was a car that had stopped. And so I wave, and sh her window was rolled down. And I yell at her. And I say, call 911. I've been shot. And she said, I already have. Which way did they go? And I said, that way. And she took off after them in her car. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so then, all of a sudden, my, that's when I felt my lungs collapse. And I couldn't breathe anymore. And um, I'm doubling over, and I'm gasping for air. And there were all these men that came running. And there were valet guys, waiters from all these area um, restaurants. And some of the valet guys I just said hi to while I was walking by. And so they came running and they sat me down and a couple of them were like kind of looking to see if they could find, they were like, what, what did they look like? And so I'm um, telling them what happened. And then the other guys were like keeping me calm, keep asking me questions to make sure that I stay conscious until the police arrived. And um, the police came and I told them as much as I could. And then the ambulance came and um, they put me in the ambulance, and I actually was only a few blocks away from Cedar sinai which happens to be one of the best hospitals in the United States. And, um, you know, it's usually, like, from where I was, it'd be, like, mm, maybe a five-minute drive if there's a red light. I swear it took, like, an hour and a half to get there. It felt, because I was in so much pain. And, um, of course, they're freaking out because they can't find the exit wounds. They have no idea, like, where this bullet is inside my body, what it's, what's happening. And um, so, but they tell me it's going to be okay. And, I even, and I'm in a lot of pain, but they're saying, it's, you're going to be okay, you're going to be okay. So I, I believe them. And now they're supposed to tell you this because if they say, like, yeah, we don't think you're going to make it, <laughs> you're just going to give up, and your body's going to be like, okay then I won't fight. But if they say you're gonna be okay, you naturally fight. And um, this is what a friend told me who's a paramedic, because I was kind of complaining, like, why didn't they give me more drugs? I was in so much pain. And he was like, because your body would have relaxed too much. So, um, so yeah, so they're telling me it's gonna be okay, and I believe them, even though I'm gasping for air and in a lot of pain. And I started thinking, and I'm like, oh man, I bet they're gonna make me spend the night. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah. And I'm trying to figure out, I wonder if there's a way to get out of spending the night in the hospital. And I'm like, I'm uninsured, I can't afford this. I can't even afford this ambulance ride. And so I'm starting to get like worried about that. And, um, and then this man, one of the paramedics, takes out these scissors. And he goes to the end of my jeans. And I'm like, oh, no! I don't know about you guys, but ladies, do you, any of you have that perfect pair of jeans? <laughs> where they're super cute, they fit perfectly in all the right places, and they're comfortable. Oh my gosh, these were those pair of jeans. So I sit up and I'm like, no, you can't cut my jeans. They push me back down and they're like, ma'am, please. And so I literally, I start like trying to shimmy out of them. I'm like, no, 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 I'll take them off. I was desperate to save those jeans. <laughs> but they cut them. <laughs> and I cried. <laughs> yeah. I found out later from the police officer who rode in the ambulance with me that they didn't think I was gonna make it to the hospital. And so I'm like, oh great, I was there dying and I'm upset about my jeans. <laughs> Thankfully, God has mercy. <laughs> So we get to the hospital, and they put two tubes in my right lung, one in my left, and they go to take an x-ray. And that's when I discovered 
um, that my esophagus had been torn because they made me drink this barium. Are any of you guys know like what barium is? This thick, white, chalky substance that like you think after all these years they would make it taste good, but they never. This just isn't. So they made me drink this, and it leaked into out of my body. Like it leaked um, and into my body. And it felt as though someone poured acid over my insides and lit a match, and like everything was on fire. It was, I'd never been in so much pain in all my life. And my reaction was to, there was a doctor standing right next to the bed, and I grabbed him and I pulled him down. And I screamed at him and said, "Make it stop!" And his eyes just filled with tears because there was nothing he could do. Well, because I had moved and I grabbed the doctor. They didn't get the X-ray, so they made me drink the barium again.、Yeah. After that, once they got their X-ray, I was rushed into emergency surgery, and I was in there for a little over eight hours. Meanwhile, my friend, who I was going to visit, who was dropping the keys off, he、um, was calling me and texting me, and I wasn't responding. And so he went outside. He heard、uh, helicopters and police sirens. So he ran outside, and the police told him that a young woman had been shot and to go back into his apartment. And he said, "I think that woman is my friend." And the police couldn't tell that him if it was me or not. And so they said, "Well, you can try the hospital." So he went back into his apartment, and he got on Facebook and Twitter, and he said, "A woman's been shot in my neighborhood. I think it's my friend. She, she usually responds, and she had just texted me saying she was going to be here in ten minutes." Um, he was like, "Please pray for her," and many people started responding and saying, "We're praying." And he went over to the hospital, and once I was in surgery, that's when they told him that it was me. And he started calling friends, and they all started coming to the hospital, and they met in the wa waiting room, and they prayed for me the entire time I was in surgery all night long. And I truly believe that it was the prayers of the church. That really helped me through this surgery and kept me alive. I really, I believe it was the grace of God and our Blessed Mother, but I truly believe that it was people praying for me. And I just encourage you guys that whenever you're on Facebook or Twitter and people put out,、um, you know, a prayer request, to take a moment and stop. And I know sometimes in my Facebook feed, like I'll get three or four, and it can easily become kind of overwhelming. But I just take a moment, and maybe I'll pray for like all three at the same time, and I'll pray a Hail Mary for them. But I realized that I'm alive because of the power of prayer, and so I understanding how powerful prayer is. I want to share that gift with. Any everyone, and so I just encourage you guys too to do that and to pray for people,、um, big or small. You have no idea how much you can affect and change a person's life because you're praying for them,、um, whether they're terminally ill or、um, in a drastic moment like I was, or you know just going through a hard time. Your prayers can change lives. God hears them. And so I know that I'm here because of that. And there are a lot of saints that people ask for their intercession as well. And、um, so I am very grateful to the church, the Universal Church, for everyone praying for me, for the saints, Church Triumphant and Victorious, and Church Militant. And、um, so yeah, so I'm so passionate about sharing how amazing prayer works. So all these people came and they were praying overnight. And、um, the surgery that they did to repair my esophagus is a very rare procedure. And、uh, the surgeons told us later that it just so happened the head surgeon on call that night was actually familiar with this very rare procedure. And so they went in through my side muscle, and they took some of the muscle out, and they used it as a patch to my esophagus. And、um, it was interesting. Going back after a, at a follow-up appointment, we asked the doctor, you know, like about my recovery because of this procedure, and、um, and he they told me that 90% of the people who have this procedure end up having complications and、um, leakage, and they end up either on a feeding tube for the rest of their life or they end up dying. So I'm in a very rare 10% that has lived, and、um, I was on a soft food diet for quite a while. But after that, I、um, I've been able to eat real food, and I to this day I can eat just about anything I want as long as I chew slowly,、um, which is <laughs> I'm still working on that part. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I forget sometimes. 
Um, so it's hard when I, I still have, I, to this day I still have residual pain and issues and sc because of scar tissue in my esophagus. And I'll start ra choking randomly. But, um, so this procedure was very intense and I came out of it and um, I was very weak for several days. I was so weak I couldn't hold my jaw up on my own. My friends and family would have to come up and hold, pick up my jaw for me. And um, I was just having to learn to walk again was very, very hard and painful. And uh, my family was able to fly out. Some of my family was able to fly out from Michigan to be with me. And at one point, my sister came, and uh, we actually had some time by ourselves. And she's my best friend. She's 19 months younger than me, and we grew up like acting like tr twins. Um, so she came, and we got some time alone. And she asked me, you know, how are you doing, and how do you feel? And she said, are you angry at this woman who shot you? Do you think you could ever forgive her? And I remember laying there and thinking, you know, I can and I have. And I told her that. And I, I said, I realize I, ha I can forgive her for three reasons, big reasons. And that in that moment, it was easy to forgive her. One was because I had so much, um, all my energy was going into trying to survive and trying to hold my jaw up on my own, that I didn't have the energy to be angry and to not forgive. It takes a lot of energy to, um, to be unforgiving and to hold on to that bitterness and anger. So I just didn't have the energy for that. The other thing is, I knew that there were a lot of people all around the world praying for me. In fact, a couple of my friends from my hometown, my home parish in Michigan are here, and I know they were praying for me. Um, people were praying rosaries at our parish for me, and so, um, I knew that that grace from their prayers helped me in that moment to freely forgive and easily forgive. And um, I also knew I could forgive her easily because I'd known what it was like not to forgive. And I never wanted to be that person ever again. And so I wanted to be a person of forgiveness. And now, um, after that, we went to trial, and I had the opportunity to speak to this young woman. And I stood up in court, and I faced her, and I looked at her, and I said, I forgive you, and I pray for you every single day that you might come to know the incredible love, mercy, and forgiveness of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I know that that was a very important moment for me. She didn't care. Um, she really wasn't interested like in anything I had to say, and um, which was hard for me, but yet... Um, I, I forgave her anyway. And it's one of those things where I've realized that forgiveness is important in those big moments. And that moment was kind of like a big boulder being moved to moving my, my mountain of healing. But also, I have the opportunity to forgive every single day. And I have the opportunity to forgive her when I still have incision pain. My lungs are very weak still. And it's easy to get frustrated. And in those moments, I can choose not forgiving her and being bitter and angry towards her, towards my situation. But instead, I can choose joy and mercy and peace. And what a better choice. What a better life. And so I strive to live a life of forgiveness. And many times I fall, but thankfully we have confession. I'm so grateful there's so much mercy for us when we do choose you know, um, to sin and uh, when we chose, choose not to forgive. But I've realized how important it is to li live a life of forgiveness. And we live in a society where we're encouraged to revenge each other. And it's all about revenge. In fact, there's a show with the title Revenge. Um, so it's really prevalent in our society. And yet we're called as Catholics to forgive. And so I just encourage you guys to strive to live your lives uh, a life of forgiveness. Join me in living lives of forgiveness. Thank you. If you're made for greatness, it means you're gonna have to sacrifice greatly. Don't you hate it when you text someone and they call you back? You can be in each other's space, but you're not in each other's lives. When I can't let myself be alone with my thoughts long enough to get bored, that's a problem. teach everything he commanded them to teach. New ways to communicate God's word. Present positive images to our people. 
this message of truth and salvation. Culture of uh, encounter. Gospel of Christ worldwide. Shalom World TV. Twenty-four-seven, faith-filled, dynamic, virtue-building, commercial-free, family-friendly, Catholic, charismatic channel to the whole world. Promote the gift of church teaching. Dedicated for the new evangelization. Mentor the young into a deeper embrace of the Catholic faith. Wonderful contributions to the church. People of prayer. Attractive people, attractive messages. Peace of Christ. Promote the values of life. This is media at its very best. The voice of the church. with great love. Taking this to the next step. Shalom World TV. Shalom. 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 Shalom World. God's own channel.